Many believe life as we know it has changed irrevocably and that in this seismic shift lies the opportunity to turn things around, improve our world and make life better for the majority, especially in poor countries. It is time to reboot Nigeria. This is Pivotal. Nigeria's oil and gas sector accounts for only 10% of GDP, but is 80% of government income. The sector is therefore significant to the Nigerian economy, but continues to suffer from dwindling investment, opaque policies and decades-long inefficiencies. At a time of increasing competition, as more countries discover oil and climate change is encouraging a shift to renewable and clean energy, there needs to be a drastic change. The COVID pandemic exposes even further the shortcomings inherent in the way Nigeria manages her oil and gas assets, leading to calls for urgent reforms. On Pivotal today, I am joined by the Minister of State for Petroleum, Mr. Timpure Silva, and the Group Managing Director of the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, the NNPC, Mr. Mele Kari. Can I start by asking the um, Honourable Minister whether there is an appetite for proper reform in Nigeria's oil and gas sector in this current government? Definitely, there is an appetite for, for reforms. Um, but of course, the basis for any reforms will be the legal uh, uh, backing for it. That is, for example, uh, you know that uh, this government is very serious about passing the PIB, which has been in process for over 20 years now. And uh, I can announce to you now that we are actually at the end of it. We are going to the National Assembly in the uh, next few weeks. And that will now form the basis for very major reforms in the industry. Uh, for example, the cost of production in Nigeria has been a challenge, I mean, for us, because we cannot continue to produce oil at uh, uh, $40 when oil is uh, being sold at $30. So definitely there are a lot of things now that need to be done to curtail, for example, our production costs and other costs in the industry. And that's why we are just waiting for the uh, body of law to be passed uh, so that we have a good basis uh, uh, on which to stand and reform this industry permanently. You have started making some reforms. For example, you issued a statement to clarify issues around the price of petroleum, around subsidy, um, and around the uh, trading of petroleum products. These are reforms that um, you've announced in your capacity as minister how much um, are you going to be able to utilize uh, this existing policy and your relationship with the National Assembly to embed this set of reforms before the PIB is passed? Well, we, 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 we realize that we have the opportunity because, of course, deregulation, as you know, is something that this country cannot continue with. First, it was benefiting uh, a certain uh, group of people, and it wasn't you benefiting the generality. You said, you said there were deregulation. Uh, yes, yeah, sub subsidy. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. No, subsidy, subsidy, sorry. <laughs> subsidy, I mean. Subsidy actually uh, ben was benefiting uh, a certain sector of the society and was not benefiting the generality of Nigeria. And the opportunity came. You know that for us, I mean, for we all know that uh, products are refined from crude oil. If crude oil prices go up, product prices will go up. If product, uh, crude oil prices come down, product prices will also come down. So when we saw that opportunity, that product prices had come down, we felt that we should that transfer that benefit to the, the average Nigerian. And we also uh, discussed with the PPP and with the regulatory authority to bring down, to discuss with the private sector and bring down the uh, cost of uh, of a product of a petroleum product. Uh, now that petroleum crude oil prices are going up a little bit, we believe that of course prices will also go up. With the regulation of the industry gone, we believe that a lot of investors in the refining sector, for example, will find it uh, uh, 
uh, attractive to invest in, uh, in, in that business. Talking about refineries, let me bring in the GMD of the NNPC here because, of course, all of the country's refineries are under his agency and yet four of them not working. Nigerians have been agitating that uh, perhaps the NNPC needs to get out of the um, uh, business of refining and sell these refineries. I hear that there is an appetite for some sort of PPP. What exactly is the plan for refineries going forward? Uh, first of all, uh, the Honorable Minister is the chairman of the board of NNPC, and he was very clear about the expectations uh, for, for industry. First, uh, the reform part of it, which he has spoken to, uh, that reform will bring private sector interest in the, in the industry. And we saw this coming. And we latch on this opportunity to ensure that we can, can bring in private partnerships into the refining uh, rehabilitation program. Uh, today, we are cash trapped. We do not have all the resources that we can put to fix the refineries. It's correct that all the four refineries are on shutdown because they are no longer practical to be operated commercially and beneficially. Uh, so what did we do different? What we decided to do is to do a first rehabilitation starting with the Potakwa refinery, but we also saw another opportunity of getting all of them done at the same time. First, uh, financing is a major issue. Uh, as I've mentioned, we don't have all the cash to put on all the refineries, so we decided to put in place a BOT arrangement where uh, private sector people will come in, put their money, they recover their costs from the tariff, uh, operate this plant jointly or through an O&M strategy. I mean, uh, uh, an operating and maintenance contract strategy so that the control goes out of the NMPC, they recover their costs over a period of time. And during that period, from the reform that will come from the, uh, the PIB that the Honorable Minister has uh, alluded to, uh, we will see a situation where private ownership of these refineries will take place so that we can start running it like the NLNG uh, ultimately. This is part of the reform that the Honorable Minister is referring to. And ultimately, in the short term, we'll get it fixed through private financing and then operate it jointly with the private sector and ultimately end up with a, uh, with a structure that, is, that will really look like the NLNG model and which will make it more efficient. And the good now, thing is it, that it, the it, market it's important is... important to clarify for just, our audience that the, when you say the LNG model, what you are referring to is the fact that the LNG consists of about five different partners and government is only one partner and is a minority shareholder. I just thought it was important to clarify that for listeners who don't understand what the NLNG model is. So please carry on. Yeah, you, yeah, you do not need five partners. Uh, it can be two partners, but uh, NMPC will be a minority partner. And how quickly are we likely to see this uh, reform? You've talked about something happening in the Portacourt uh, refinery. What is the timeline? The timeline is uh, it's not a political debt, uh, but I can assure you that our entire framework is to deliver this uh, refinery hub before uh, the mid of 2023. I want to go back to the Honorable Minister. Now, part of the issue sometimes with the sort of um, short-term reforms that you've announced is that under the current law, as the Minister, you have the responsibility, for example, for being able to set prices and all that, and the fear is always that if these policy changes are not backed by law, what you end up with is a situation where if somebody comes in that perhaps has a different approach to this industry, then you get things rolled back. And so, again, the question is regarding the sort of short-term uh, measures that you're taking to reform the, the sector ahead of the PIB, which you've committed in this program to passing. What... What are you going to do to ensure that, you know, if for any reason you, let's assume you get posted to another ministry and the person who comes after you then doesn't change things? This process is absolutely legal. Uh, PPPR uh, is empowered by law to sit with all the uh, partners, all the uh, operators of the downstream sector. I mean, they have representatives on the PPPR board. Uh, Mormon has a representative. That man has a representative, NLC has a representative. They are all represented on the board. They, are, they have a committee, pricing committee, which comprises of all these bodies, and then they determine the price, the landing price for that period, 
and of course the pump price. So this is all legal. This is all legal. What we have done is to try to make sure that we actually take a regulatory position. Government, of course, as a tradition, by tradition, government should be a regulator. We do not want private sector to just overlay, just profiteer on the people. What we have also done this time is to engage stakeholders, all the stakeholders, before we go to the National Assembly. So, so to say, we will be going, holding hands to the National Assembly, and then there will be very few controversial areas before we go to the National Assembly. So we expect that this is this law is not going to stay in the this bill is not going to stay in the National Assembly for, for very long this time. So I can assure you that before I get uh, redeployed or before the end uh, end of this administration, if uh, I, uh, any, any such thing happens, then we will have a law backing this process. I can assure you that. One of the announcements you made was that that you were going to allow private sector to start selling products. Now, I wanted to find out um, how feasible that is going to be and whether the NNPC will not continue to enjoy some sort of advantage over the private sector, given the excess dollars from the CBN uh, that uh, private sector operators cannot um, um, access. I, are you concerned about this at all? We have said that now the private sector can access uh, uh, um, forex at the same rate as NMPC. Right. We have taken away all those dis uh, all those differences in CBN. So private sector and NMPC. If NMPC want to continue to uh, import, they will be accessing uh, um, forex at the same rate as private sector. And moreover, I told you that the reason we believe that private sector was not really engaging in this activity was because of subsidy. They could not get this product in and sell it at, 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 uh, at a loss. So NMPC was filling this gap because this is a very strategic commodity. And as you know, if we have any scarcity, it will be a problem. So NMPC was only coming in to fill that gap. But now, if private sector takes over, because now without subsidy, private sector will go in there and make profit under our watchful eyes so that they don't over profit here. We will watch that to make sure and to ensure that we protect the consumers. With the removal of subsidy, we believe that this is going to encourage the participation of private sector. Let me speak to the GMD of NMPC and ask him if he can explain in this um, period between now and the passage of the PIB, which the minister has assured is going to take place. Can you, in a nutshell, Tell us what you think the primary role of the NNPC will be. Okay, thank you. I understand. Uh, Kadra, uh, yes, the, the ultimate objective of uh, the PIB is to create a commercial national oil company. Yes, sir. It will be an NNPC or any name the government will choose for it. Yes, sir. Or the shareholders will choose for it. So a commercial company means it's a company that is now an energy company and no longer just a, a downstream or a midstream company. An energy company is an end-to-end -end company which is completely engaged in doing business for the purpose of driving value for its shareholders. That it will declare direct profit and it will declare dividend. So what we are doing today now, towards the transition, we are not going to wait for the legislation. And the minister has assured that the legislation will come very quickly. And we are already taking position against a future company that will be a completely commercial company. Everything today we are doing will be is driven by our urge and our desire and the decision to make sure that we make profit from this business, eliminate the businesses that don't thrive, uh, build on the businesses that will bring us more, more revenue and cash flow, and also to reduce our costs uh, substantially so that there's value for the investments that we are making. So in that effect, you know, we have current cash flows. We are looking for partners. We have gotten partners in very many angles, including the BOT arrangement that you have alluded to, uh, but in terms of our pipelines, our refinery operation, and many other opportunities that we have, even in the upstream, where we have financial and technical partnership, where people bring in their money, we sweat the assets, we make money and share the margins uh, jointly. So overall, this is a company in transition run from what you know to, a, to an energy company within the, uh, the short frame of time that we are seeing. Okay. I, I want to ask a question of both you and the minister, because players in the sector 
whether in government or private sector, have kind of reached an agreement that there's a need for reform. But there is a little bit of frustration because there is a gap. And the comprehensive reform that the private sector is pushing for is only possible with a PIB. But in the meantime, we see government trying to do short-term reforms, such as the things that were announced by the minister. Let me give you an example of some of the concerns. So, for example, the AKK in midstream, the pipeline that is supposed to leave from Ajakuta and go to um, Kaduna and Kano and, and Kano Gas. Um, it has been allocated. It's supposed to start building as a cost of something like 1.2 or a little bit over $1.2 billion. There seems to be an inability within government for efficiency, for value for money. How do you reassure um, both stakeholders in the sector, but also Nigerians, that your short-term reforms represent value for money when a project that was supposed to be take Take, you know, cost $400 million in 2013 is now costing over $1.2 billion. Well, uh, if, 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 Jim, do you want to start first? Please let me start. First of all, okay. yes, I don't know uh, your source of data, Kadria, but uh, I can assure you that the cost of the AKK pipeline today is not 1.2, it is $2.5 billion, actually. Ah. And this cost was... Uh, Yes, it's higher than what you said. <laughs> okay. So it is not 1.2 billion. It is actually 2.5 billion dollars. Uh, it was initially uh, 2.8 billion dollars, and uh, because of the arrangement that is in place, supposed to be 15 percent financed by local uh, EPC contractors and 85 percent by our Chinese partners. Our local partners are unable. We are unable to raise the 15 percent equity. And that result in a negotiation of the entire contract sum, entry of NMPC to cover that gap, and we are able to renegotiate that contract from the 2.8 billion or so down to 2.5 billion, a little above 2.5 billion dollars. Why is I'm not aware that this project between the private sector bid in 2013 and the amount that is being spent now? That's the point I'm making. I'm not aware of any 400 million dollar. Uh, cost estimate for this uh, this project. I don't know the source of this information. Okay. Uh, you can share with me. Well, 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 uh, Kadaria, let yes, me come in here. Yes, Maybe it's a different project, uh, but definitely uh, it's unlikely to be the AKK project. This project, this project was to start much earlier, just as you yourself said yes, that the AKK was supposed to have started very early, but unfortunately, earlier on. But unfortunately, they couldn't uh, start. And the GMD said, look, the problem was that the private sector people who were supposed to be partners uh, on this project couldn't raise the money. You know that there are, there are all kinds of tricks in this uh, in the industry. People come, reduce prices below what is uh, possible, and then you give them the project they can't perform. So these kind of things are the things that have kept this country back because people just want to get a, a, to, a toehold on the project with some unrealistic bids. For example, if that happened, I'm just saying, if that happened, you have to also avert your mind to this possibility. So they could have come in with those kind of ridiculous bids and couldn't perform. And that is why, if, they, if it was that cheap, why didn't they do it? Since then, you can see that something was definitely wrong. But seriously, uh, if we are talking, uh, you know, in today's world, we believe that this project is one of the, it's, it, it's an international project, everybody can check, and we believe that it is very well costed. Okay, in sir. addition to what you have with Adria, let me just add something to the comment you made around the uh, commerciality of the project. This project, it, the cost will be recovered from its own cash flow. There will be not be a single dollar subsidy from government to fund this project. The banks will not lend you money if they cannot see the cash flow around essentially not just the gas, not from, not from the gas supply, but from the tariff that this gas line will deliver. And the basis of the finance itself is completely revolving around the tariff. And without the visibility of off-takers, no bank will put money his money into this any project of this nature, more so this gas uh, gas project. So, so how confident confirm to you, are you? You can get off-takers because we haven't heard anything around that particular area. And part of 
The problem, again, I'm told by people in the industry, is that the laws and the policies required that allow people, for example, to be able to know who is putting what into that, who is taking it out, all of that is not in place. Sorry, uh, James, I was going to take Kadaria's attention to the network code that was launched earlier on this year. If anybody says that there is no uh, um, uh, regulation around uh, the participation in uh, the business on the pipeline, uh, I, I think they are, they, are not, they are not correct because we have launched the network code. Um, so that tells you that anybody that puts in is a product, anybody, so we can always uh, track and then uh, people can get paid and then business can go on uh, uh, very uh, smoothly. I don't, I don't think that's correct. If, uh, I don't know who you are talking to, but you can uh, uh, point them to the network code that was launched by DPR earlier this year, if, uh, if they say that. Okay. And the other issue I want to talk to you was about communication. Again, if we reference the statement that you released, um, trying to clarify issues around subsidy, clearly there was a lot of misunderstanding um, when the GMD of NMPC initially announced the change in the price of, uh, pump price of uh, fuel, and then the change that then subsequently happened, seeming to indicate that you are kind of playing catch up with communication and that Nigerians are not being told clearly. So I'm saying, what are the plans for proper communication going forward so that Nigerians are kept abreast uh, transparently of everything that is happening uh, yes, yes. as far as the oil and gas sector is concerned? Uh, yeah. Um, frankly, Kadaria, I thought that it was communicated very well enough uh, when we announced the revolution earlier. Um, that was why yesterday I had to issue the statement to explain things a little bit further when I saw that it was not understood. Because we had said from the beginning that on March 29th, we are taking out the regulation. And of course, on that day, we announced the reduction of prices at that time, because crude oil prices were down. And on that occasion, I was very clear that crude oil, the product prices follow the crude oil prices, and at any time crude oil prices begin to recover, we might see that impact on the price. I said that, but unfortunately, some people thought that we were still under the uh, uh, regulated regime. And finally, so if I again. could hear from both you and the GMD, um, if, if you would, in a nutshell, tell us, you know, in summary, what are the immediate reforms we're going to see and what you are promising Nigerians here on air as regarding the PIB, the Petroleum Industry Bill, um, I don't want to. I don't want to preempt the PIB. You know, it is going to the National Assembly, mm. and in the end, it is the National Assembly that will be responsible uh, for passing the PIB. Can you and, uh, tell us when you, it will go to the National Assembly? No, it will go to the National Assembly within the next two weeks. And which Within the are you sending? Because we understand there are multiple versions. Is it the version that was with no, the there is, assembly? There is, is there it is, a different one. There is only one PIB now. There is only one PIB, uh, the governance and the administration uh, aspect of the PIB and the, uh, the fiscal side of the PIB. There is only one PIB bill at this point. The, the one there is no other community. PIB. You've mentioned three parts. Yes, the, that is the host, the, no, no there, there are parts to the PIB. Yes, sir. The one part dealing with governance issues, the yes. one part dealing with the gov governance issues in the industry, the another part dealing with fiscal issues, and then another part dealing with host community issues. These are the three parts of the bill, but they are one bill. Okay, so and, and, and all of them are going to the National Assembly in two weeks, you said? It is all going as one bill to the National Assembly in two weeks. In two weeks. Okay, sir, and as far as the NNPC is concerned, sir, just to round up, um, again, in summary, can you reiterate for us 
what you think the, the, the short-term reforms you'll be focusing on and what your promise is to Nigerians as far as the administration of the NNPC is concerned. Okay. Thank you very much, Kadria. Uh, our our long term is to become an energy company, an integrated energy company that will be driven by commercial considerations and that will deliver value to its shareholders uh, ultimately and also in the short term. Uh, to do this, uh, we're expanding our business, we're reducing our costs, we're increasing our cash flow possibilities, which will take us to the uh, to the dream position of being an, a massive energy company that will deliver value to its share, shareholders. In form of reforms, uh, what do we do? Uh, we have processes, we have automation that is ongoing and have taken to end to end. And even during the COVID automated company, yes, it's not 100% completed, but today we do 80 to 90% of our transactions on electronic platform and we're seeing greater efficiency, we're seeing greater trust from our shareholders and our partners. People want to put their money to this business from very many quarters. We have gotten closure about financing. Within six weeks to get financing of a billion dollars means that this company is changing. We are adding value to this company and, and the shareholders will be happy in the, in the long term. Thank you. Okay, um, Honorable Minister of State for Petroleum and the Group Managing Director of um, NNPC, thank you so much for joining us on Pivotal. I appreciate your time and thank you for your patience, despite all the technical issues that we had. Thank you. Thank you, Nadaria. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much.